Well, you can turn again to Romans chapter 16. As you're turning there, think about how many Christians take a, an honest look at their, their lives themselves and assume that their limited knowledge or giftings, talents, even energy mean that they really don't amount to much in the kingdom of God. I'm just a little guy here in a little church on the edge of a little town and can I really make much of a difference? Well, my, my favorite theologian, Francis Schaeffer, countered this idea with a, a biblical truth. And he presented his case that in, in God and with God, there is no such thing as someone of no account. His book was called No Little People. Anyone read that? You're familiar with that. It's a great, wonderful book. I think it's still in print. Listen to this quote. <clears throat> Jesus commands Christians to consciously seek the lowest room or position. All of us, pastors, teachers, professional religious workers, non-professional included, are tempted to say, I will take the higher place because it gives me more influence for Christ. Both individual Christians and Christian organizations fall prey to the temptation of rationalizing this way as we build bigger and bigger empires. But according to the scripture, this is backwards. We should consciously take the lowest place unless the Lord himself extrudes or molds us into the greater one. Amen. It's God that says, come up here to this higher place of the table, you know, as Jesus taught. And as we sh should all know, a local assembly, local church, cannot be thought of as just performative or as just what the pastor does or a sermon and some hymns. But it's a spiritual community where everyone is valued and where everyone has something to give, something to offer. And as I said last week, uh, everyone, whether man, woman, boy, or girl, plays a part in the local church. Most of the time, this work is behind the scenes. Here's a, <clears throat> here's a revelation that'll shock you. Men and women are different. Men are task-oriented, generally speaking, in the main. And women tend to be more oriented toward what? Relationships. But we men can take a page from this text today, from the example of Paul. And we can see how this very <clears throat> task-oriented, mission-oriented man could be very warm and tender-hearted as he seeks to encourage the church at Rome. So if you notice from the, uh, from the heading, we're going to go from Romans chapter 16, verses 8 through 16, and then we're going to cover 17 through 20 next week. We're also going to get into 21 through 24. So it's really those that are to be greeted and those who greet you. So first we'll look, what, what people is Paul telling the Romans to greet? Well, let's pick it up in verse 8. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Trifiana and Trifosa, workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus choice man in the Lord, and also his mother and mine. Greet Astrocritus, Flesian, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brethren with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints that are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. And then this list beginning in verse 21. These are the people that greet the Romans. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you, and so do Lucius and Jason 
and Sosipater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. And Quartus, the brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. So let's be honest, how many of us tend to kind of fuzz out on the genealogies in the Old Testament? Okay. <laughs> the rest of you are liars. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes it's, there's a lot of names there. and uh, is this, Some dear one in our congregation got hacked recently and my advice for passwords is you pick those obscure genealogy names, put a couple together, put some dollar signs and numbers. You'll be good. You'll be all right. However, I had, I had lunch with Zeke Friday, and he was telling me in his, his class with Dr. Harmon at Grace, he's going through Philippians, he's writing a paper on Philippians, and how it can be kind of repetitive after a while, and you're like, okay, okay. But then you begin to see stuff that you missed. Oh, why didn't I see that the first eight times I read it? Well, that's kind of the way it is with this list of people. We're going to pick up things here that I think you may find reflect in your own life. So let's go through and start, start reading through and say, okay, I know someone just like that. And here Paul is saying, look, Romans, no little people. I want to acknowledge you, recognize you, and greet you. So first of all, Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord, verse 8. Ampliatus was a pretty common name and was also a common slave name. He was probably a slave or maybe a freed slave. And there's actually an inscription in an old Roman catacomb that has the name Ampliatus. Let's go back 2,000 years to pagan Rome and walk through the town and just keep in mind one out of every three people you meet is a slave. Rome was full of slaves. There was no HR department to take your complaint to, there's no Toby. It was 24-7. Full time. In fact, it was so embedded in Roman culture that slaves were almost like invisible. There was certainly no injustice inferred if someone owned a slave in Rome. That's just how it is. They were also the lowest strata of society. Even a freed criminal had more rights than a slave. Slaves had no legal status, no individuality, <clears throat> couldn't really create relations independent of their master or even families, and they certainly couldn't own property. However, if we go back 2,000 years to this early first century church, you're going to find that way more than one in three people in the congregation are slaves. The early church was made up of quite a bit people that were slaves. That's why Paul can write to his letter to Titus in chapter 2, verse 9. He says, urge bond slaves or slaves to be subject to their own masters and everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that they will, anyone, adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. In other words, Paul has the long view. He's not saying, slaves, rise up, kill your masters, do whatever it takes, commit murder. No, he wants the gospel to be furthered. So he was instructing, very common, slaves, obey your master, so that your master will, what did we hear in Sunday school? Eventually go, why do you hope like you do, 1 Peter 3, 16? What is the reason for the hope that lies within you? 
and you have a Philemon experience with Onesimus rather than bloody uprising. And he calls this person my beloved in the Lord. And Paul doesn't just dole this out to everyone, but obviously he knew this man. And Ampliatus probably knew Paul from Corinth, probably served Paul in Corinth. We're not sure. But obviously Paul loves this man and he loves him in the Lord. He is a brother in Christ. There are no little people. Verse 9, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. Stachus, my beloved. Urbanus is probably also a slave or a freeman. But if you allow your eyes to go up the text a bit, back to verse 5. Epionidas, greet Epionidas, my beloved, first convert to Christ in Asia. And unlike Ampliatus and Prissa and Aquila, he calls my fellow workers. Paul says our fellow workers, so he's probably only familiar with Urbanus through reputation, through what he's heard about him from the Roman church. And what about Stachys? This is all we know right here. This is it. No other reference in the Bible. Other than he was also beloved by Paul. And like I said last week, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> so, a million years from now, when you're in eternity and you meet Stakies, you can say, wow, you were in the book of Romans. Good to meet you. Now, verse 10, Apelles, that's a relatively rare name. We really don't know anything else about him except greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. What does that mean to be approved in Christ? I thought it was, you know, grace alone, faith alone, you're approved, right? Well, Paul gives him this extra bit of honor. And he means that this man had proved himself under duress. Probably a very difficult time. Test of faith. He's respected. How many of you can think of people in your own life who have gone through some heavy stuff and come out stronger Christians at the end of it. I believe it's a man who has been through the ringer. He's been tested. By the way, go back 2,000 years, ancient Rome, not exactly the most friendly place to someone who wants to live uprightly in Christ Jesus. What did Paul Tell Timothy, if this is your desire, if you're a Christian and you want to live uprightly, you will be what? Persecuted. That's right. And what was the charge of the Romans against Christians? They're atheists. Why? Because they don't join us in worshiping all our idols. It reminds me, too, of James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been... There's the word approved. It's the same Greek word. He will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So Apelles, someday we'll get to meet him, and he can tell us about his, his trial. Now the second part of verse 10, greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Well, this would be members of this household, probably slaves, again, themselves. But notice, Paul doesn't say, greet Aristobulus directly. He says, greet those of the household of Aristobulus. He's probably not a believer. It's interesting, there is a connection here, though. He may be King Herod Agrippa, remember Agrippa from the 
last part of the book of Acts. He may be his brother who died around A.D. 48, which would be before this letter. But again, these people are not high echelon citizens. They're low on the totem pole. And they are wonderful Christian brothers and sisters. They're not little people. Verse 11, greet Herodian, my kinsman, and greet those of the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Well, here Paul begins with some people that have a little more prominence in society, prominent members. Um, Herodian would be a fellow Jew, like Paul, who was a Christian and a freed man. And this might only be in connection with, as I said, Herod Agrippa. So Herodian's not this guy's real name. We could safely conclude that. But everyone knows who he is. Greet him. So he would have been a part of a very highly respected household. And then Narcissus is the name of a well-known freedman who served the Emperor Claudius. And by the way, this man also committed suicide before the book of Romans. So again, Paul is saying, I want you to greet these people who are of this person's household, and this person is a prominent personage. So as with verse 10, the people... Paul greets will have been members of this household. So now we meet an interesting pair. Verse 12, Trifiana and Trifosa, workers in the Lord. These are women, probably slaves, could be freed slaves, we don't know. Probably sisters, might have even been twin sisters, the way the, the names work. And both Trifiana and Trifosa come from a word that means delicate or dainty. So greet delicate and dainty workers in the Lord. I don't, we don't know if there's any intended irony there. We don't know. I, I like to think that maybe there is. Just allow me that little dalliance. Because there are other plays on word that words that Paul and the apostles make. I also think there's, there is some humor in the Bible. I mean, we're coming up to Resurrection Sunday and everyone's standing around gawking, freaking out, and I could use some fish. Anyone got any something, something to eat? It's timing. So again, these are workers in the Lord, which means that they are given this reputation by their good deeds. Which brings us to Persis, the beloved, who has worked hard in the Lord. See what, you, see what you miss when you just gloss over the genealogies? There's stuff in here. Persis, probably an older woman. He uses the past tense. Here's someone who has the reputation of good works. Remember where we... Find that, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Someone who has the, a reputation of being hospitable, of serving other people. Can you think of someone in your life who has that reputation of serving other people, of working hard so that other people are taken care of? I sure do. A couple years ago, I read that uh, anniversary announcement in the newspaper from 1910 of my great great that would have been my yeah my great great grandparents and apparently my great great grandma had, had a stroke and so she wasn't able to do the usual stuff but the newspaper article mentioned that um, her her daughters and daughter-in-law made sure that the tables groaned under all the food like she would have done herself I thought, that's pretty cool And a lot of these ladies, you know, mocked in our culture, the church lady, right? 
Would the church function without the church lady, by the way? No. I'm not going to embarrass her, but her name rhymes with Rudy, and she's been faithful, and you show up and play piano. Greet Judy, a uh, still hard worker in the Lord. By the way, I know you worked hard because I saw your VBS stuff that got moldy in the basement, so we had to get rid of that. Verse 13, greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Here's don't let your mind wander to Leighton Flowers and his choice meats. That's not what he's talking about. And actually, he may be the son of Simon of Cyrene, who carried the cross on the way to Golgotha. So I think when, he, when he's calling Rufus a, a choice one or elect one, I don't think he's speaking of just like one of the many other elect ones who are Christians, but he's really an outstanding guy outstanding man. He's a choice man. He's the kind of man that if you've got a tough job to do, you want Rufus by your side with his Makita and his <laughs> wire cutters. I can think of one like that. Rufus Farber. <laughs> choice man in the Lord. We love you, Floyd. Rufus. Verse 14. Greet Asyncretus. There, there we go. I, I did it. I played that hard chord. Asyncretus. Flesian, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes and his brethren, and the brethren with them. We really don't know anything specifically about Asyncretus. Legion, Hermes, Petrobus, and Hermes, except that they're probably, again, what social status? They're probably slaves too. And then he adds all the saints who are with them. That probably refers to all the Christians that meet in their house church. And by the way, house churches were churches. They had elders and deacons and the Lord's Supper, and baptized. They weren't just a glorified Bible study. But again, Paul says, I want you to greet these people. They matter in the kingdom. There are no little people. Verse 15, greet Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. So here Paul combines the, the masculine name Philologus with the feminine name Julia, he lets us know that they were probably husband and wife. And then Nearest, which is a masculine name, and his sister were probably their children. We don't know for sure, but that's a pretty good guess. And they too have apparently opened up their home for Christians to meet in. Did you know that in, in the first century it, it was not uncommon for someone who had a little bit of wealth to add an extra room, just have an open space so that churches could meet. This is before church buildings came into uh, common practice. <clears throat> Paul knows only a, one other member of their house, Olympus, mentioning the others, kind of generally all the saints that are with them. So after he greets all these people, say, give my love, my greeting, he adds this, verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. So these are, these are standard requests, right? 1 Corinthians 16, 20, 2 Corinthians 13, 1 Thessalonians 5, and even 1 Peter 5, 14, greet one another. Now, what do we do with the holy kiss? was a common form of greeting. By the way, it's still common in the Middle East. Men will meet, kiss each other, and wish something upon the other person. They say Salim. We would think of it as Shalom. It's called the kiss of peace. It's a, it's a way of saying, I wish you all the peace. And in fact, evidence from the second century 
indicates that this was actually part of church liturgy. Now, I want to I want to tell you a little story about the kiss of peace. As most of you know, I'm <clears throat> I'm the soul of tact. Um, always very careful in what I say. And uh, also, I'm an old hippie, so there's some other weird stuff going on. Um, but there are, there are men in my life that I will kiss on the cheek. It's completely non-sensual. It's a brotherly hug. Uh, Bill Yorka, he probably goes like this when I leave. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a woman named Rachel Held Evans? Any, anyone? Godless mocker of God's word, styled herself as a progressive Christian feminist. Had a blog that was pretty famous for a while. <clears throat> One time she had a, a guest writer, and it was in essence trying to equate what Titus 2 tells younger and older women as being just cultural. Yeah, all of you with children and a house to take her. Oh, yeah, that's cultural, <laughs> right? <clears throat> Call me at four in the afternoon, right? But trying to make that as cultural as wine and communion and the holy kiss. So ever the soul of tact, I, again, the smart aleck, 16-year-old, I said, hey, um, we use wine and communion, and I give the holy kiss. Is that okay? Well, no, because it had nothing to do with that. They were just trying to mock the idea of there being this, you know, sphere of influence and primary orientation that a woman should have. The holy kiss is like, why would Paul tell them to do that? Because you are acknowledging all the rest of the Christians out there. It, it's it's like. With us, when we meet someone, <laughs> maybe not exactly like us, but we know they're believers and we love them, we're going to extend our hand, shake it, pat on the soldier or the shoulder, holy kiss if you're so bold and you really want to freak them out, you know. But it's a it's a way Paul is saying acknowledge all the churches, greet one another with this kiss of peace, this way of saying. I love you and the Lord. I will go to bat for you. You're one of us. Amen. So that I, I could go on with my Rachel Held Evans story, but the, <laughs> I've got it all saved as a PDF. So now let's let's now skip down. Those are the people that they're to greet. What about those who give their greeting to the Church of Rome? Let's check them out. So verse 21, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. And so do Lucius and Jason and Sosipat are my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. And Cordus, the brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So Paul mentions, first of all, Timothy, if you know anything about Timothy, he was Paul's closest ministry associate. He was, Paul discipled Timothy so that Timothy could eventually um, oversee the churches in Ephesus, which is where he died, by the way. So Timothy was from Lystra in South Galatia. It's down by Alabama, South Galatia. Timothy joined Paul and the whole missionary team at the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey back in Acts 16. And Timothy worked with Paul throughout the rest of that journey as well. Timothy was probably left behind in Greece or Macedonia when Paul went back to Jerusalem, met up with Paul again when Paul came back on his third Missionary journey. By the way, he was with Paul later when Paul was imprisoned in his first imprisonment, which was house imprisonment. And he worked with him after his release in that same air, uh, Mediterranean area. 
So as this verse makes clear then, Paul, uh, Timothy was with Paul while Paul is writing this letter from that area in Corinth. And actually think about this, how, how central this young man was to Paul's missionary work. Very significant to Paul. Paul introduces Timothy as the co-author of six of the books of the New Testament. 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Now, Paul doesn't mention this in Romans because part of the issue with Romans is that Paul's apostolic mission to the Gentiles is at stake, and these people have never met Timothy. But he said he includes him. Timothy greets you. He, he, Andy Griffith fans, remember when Goober says, "Hey, tell, hey, make sure you tell." All that is again, it's like giving through another person your love, your affection. I want you to tell them I said hi. That's not just a nothing. That's that's actually something. I want you communicate for me because I can't do it. I can't be there. Tell that person I say. Hey, how about it when you're on the receiving end of that? Oh, by the way, Bill Paxton says, hey. Like, oh, will you tell them hey for me? Now, Lucius probably identified with Lucius of Cyrene, who would have been a prophet teacher in the church at Syrian Antioch. Acts 13, we can't be 100% sure of that, but that's probably who it is. Now, Jason, on the other hand, Jason, is very, very probably the Jason from Acts 17, 5 through 9, who gave Paul some housing and food. And by the way, remember what happened to Jason as a result of that, Acts 17. They say, hey, what are you doing? Giving aid to the enemy. The whole crowd's ready to tear him apart. Who is this Sosipater? He's almost certainly the Sopater of Berea that Luke tells us accompanied Paul when he left Greece in Acts 20, verse 4. And Paul tells us that all three of these men are fellow Jews, my kinsmen. They were also, interesting fact, probably delegates from churches selected to escort Paul with that collection that he's taking to Jerusalem that we talked about a few weeks back. So Goober says, hey, no little people. These guys say hello. Verse 22, Tertius is otherwise unknown to us, but here he's Paul's secretary. Amenunsis is the, the Greek word. He wrote down as Paul dictated. Remember, Paul probably had some issues with his eyes, made it difficult to see as he got older. So isn't it interesting? Paul, Paul lets this guy give his own greeting. I, <laughs> I'm writing this down. I say hi to. And then Gaius is probably Gaius from Corinth, since Paul is writing this from Corinth. And he's probably the host to any church or any Christian from the whole church that might be coming through Corinth. So Gaius was, again, this guy who hosts the church, says hello, gives his greeting. But then here we have this man named Erastus. I'm almost, I'm almost done with the list and we'll wrap this up. I'm starting to zone out too. Erastus is called an oikonomos. Oikonomos, e economy manager. Oikonome is household. It's, it's important to have a household that's productive, right? But he's probably a treasurer, an official in Corinth, pretty high up. So he says hi. And then there's Cordus the brother. That's all we know about Cordus. He's, he's a brother. And that's enough. He's in the book of Romans. 
He's a brother. There's no little people. In the kingdom, in God's oikonomo, there is no. So let's make some application as we, as we close this. I hope, I hope you recognized some of the qualities of the people that were being listed, some of the things that they were known for, maybe in your life, maybe in other people's lives. And it's okay sometimes if you're beginning Second Chronicles to do a little fuzzing out. I do. I look, I look for the differences, you know, like in numbers, you know, it's going to be the same thing 12 times in a row. We know that. But first of all, <clears throat> let's keep in mind that Paul's reference to people that are beloved of him or his co-workers. That means Paul wasn't a lone ranger. Paul didn't do all this all by himself. In fact, he, he encouraged people to help. Pray for me as I do this work. Help me on my way. Priscilla and Aquila, co-laborers, literally making tents together so that they wouldn't be a burden on others. Paul depended on a significant number of other people to come alongside and work with him. We see that in, in some local churches where the emphasis is on this predilection that it's, it's only the pastor and only the elders that do the important work and, and you're just to be shepherded. That's only a little true. But the rest of it is that pastors and elders are supposed to build you up so that you go do works in the kingdom. That's Ephesians 4. So Paul wasn't a lone ranger. And I'll mention this again. <clears throat> Second, Paul's mention of nine women in this list remind us again of what an important role in the early church women played. In fact, five of these women, we, we didn't, did we mention Mary last week? She was kind of in passing. Mary was, that's okay. But five of these women, Prissa, Junia, Trephania, Trephosa, and Persis are commended for their labor in the Lord. So ministry is a word that we have baggage attached. It just means service. Service. In the early church, it's never confined to the men. And these greetings make that abundantly clear. So, you know, to kind of tie it in with last week's message, which, by the way, I got a lot of good feedback from last week. To tie that in, just because a person doesn't hold a position of authority doesn't mean that they're not a valuable contributor to the overall body of Christ. And I think that's part of the issue with the movement today. It's just a lack of satisfaction in your own calling, you know. I know there, there, are, there are men in this room who could teach the Bible just as well as anyone else. But you got other stuff going on. You haven't, right? I remember years ago, I was, I was doing my Christian music thing, and I always preached the gospel pretty, pretty strongly after the gig. And I was telling this to a pastor, and he kind of got this weird look, and he goes, oh, oh well, that could be a ministry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I know what he meant though, right? We tend to we have these ideas of what what constitutes a an official stamp of, you know, God's approval on a ministry and what is Paul saying here? This is the kingdom of God that we're to be pursuing and building. The local church is that primary outpost of the kingdom of God. The worship of God is never less than the 52 weeks a year Sunday morning worship. He goes, and within this community, as, as it says in Galatians, there's, there's not that kind of uh, societal strata that's supposed to be emphasized at all. In fact, it shouldn't exist in the regeneration. Everybody has stuff to do. 
There's no little people. If you need help finding out what it is that you're supposed to do, we can talk about that. But according to this list, there's no little people in the kingdom. Amen. All right, let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you that we can trust you with all of these things. We thank you that we aren't required by you to go beyond what is written. In fact, we're prohibited from it. And we thank you for these dear saints who lived 2,000 years ago who can help us in giving examples of those who, regardless of social station, were workers in Christ who, who joyfully gave of themselves to the assembly, who would have looked to Sunday not as drudgery, but as a relief from the seven-day-a-week work. To be with those who are like-minded, who can encourage and be encouraged. So, Lord, help us to remember these things, remind us of these things, that we would glorify you with all of our lives in our thoughts and words and deeds. We give you all the glory and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.